Thank you very much for choosing Breakout Room 1. Uh, my name is Josh Deutschman. I'm a PhD candidate on the market this year at, um, at UW-Madison. Um, and I'm presenting some joint work with, uh, with Tangi Bernard at the University of Bordeaux and Wambi Yameogo at, the, at IITA. Um, so diving right in, um, this project is motivated um, by this idea that linking producers to export markets can improve welfare. Um, and this is a result we've seen um, certainly in agricultural contexts as well as um, in, in kind of non-agricultural contexts. Um, what I'm talking about here is, is, is a bit specific to agriculture, but I think these, these results and these ideas are somewhat general. Um, so in order to access these international markets, producers must be able to meet uh, international quality standards. Uh, and these quality standards can present a major barrier to market access in many contexts. Now, we know from work on, especially on, on technology adoption, um, that producers may face multiple constraints to quality upgrading, including potentially the availability of credit, um, information about new technologies or how to use them, and uncertainty about the rewards to upgrading the quality of their production. So in this project, we, we aim to address this question of can a new contracting arrangement, which addresses these constraints, induce quality upgrading by small producers? So we study this question with groundnut cultivation in Senegal. Certainly, this is a really important question domestically in Senegal. Groundnuts are the most valuable agricultural export, uh, and they're also widely consumed locally, and they use more than 40% of cultivated land. Um, but this is also a big deal kind of globally. Um, groundnuts and a variety of other crops, including maize um, and some other staple crops, are vulnerable to aflatoxin contamination. Now, aflatoxins are highly carcinogenic compounds, um, and one study estimated that more than 4 billion people may be chronically exposed. So this is a really huge public health problem, um, and it's also a, a, an economic problem for producers because phytosanitary standards for aflatoxin contamination restrict export market access, particularly to the most lucrative high-income markets. Um, and in this context, another kind of important feature to highlight real quick is that um, most farmers in Senegal are members of cooperatives. These cooperatives aim to provide a variety of services to their members, um, and, and we think that this is a potential channel by which we can facilitate um, contracting and ultimately quality upgrading. So in this experiment, we uh, partnered with two cooperatives in the Groundnut Basin of Senegal. And as I mentioned, we designed a new contracting arrangement, which tries to address uh, three potential constraints to quality upgrading, namely credit, uh, training, and uh, certainty about the rewards to quality upgrading. And so in this case, we provide um, a reliable price premium for certified high quality production. Um, and we run a cluster randomized trial with about 400 farmers to test the impact of this contract offer on, on three main, main outcomes, which I'll talk about really quickly here, um, and then we can kind of get into the discussion. Um, so first, when we look at technology adoption, um, first, what I want to highlight is that there was a small amount of adoption in the control group. Um, so, you know, we gave farmers information about a new technology, information about a problem. Some of them may have been motivated by the potential health benefits to quality upgrading or optimistic that they might find a buyer. Um, but we do see quite a large treatment effect on this kind of first stage effect on adoption um, of almost 80 percentage points. So, you know, existing work in the literature suggests that addressing each one of the constraints that we cover individually um, is typically not sufficient to, uh, to, to, to achieve a particularly large treatment effect like we see here. Um, and there is some increasing evidence that bundling programs together um, can have large impacts for farmers. And so it seems like what we're addressing here is, is a, a, a sufficient group of constraints to enable pretty widespread adoption of this new technology. Um, so when we look at actually the effects of this contract offer on quality improvements, um, it's important to disaggregate areas which are at high risk and low risk. And so using remote sensing data on um, growing season conditions, we're able to show that the, the treatment is really effective in areas that would otherwise be at high risk of contamination. Whereas in areas that are at low risk, there's not much room for improvement because groundnuts are already very good quality um, and we shouldn't expect a huge improvement. There's also potentially room for complementary interventions to kind of get even closer to, to full compliance with these standards. Um, so finally, I'll just address briefly that um, what we see is um, in terms of commercial arrangements and, and, and choices by producers is that um, farmers who receive this contract offer are more likely to sell output to the cooperative. Um, so I wanna highlight that there's quite a lot of side selling in this market. Um, only 23% of producers in the control group sold any of their output to the cooperative. Um, 
And so we're seeing this increase in output sales to the cooperative at both extensive and intensive margins. And, and the magnitude of the effect on the intensive margin is larger than the credit we provided in the contract. So this isn't just a case of, of credit repayment. Um, and we also find some interesting heterogeneity here, which I'm happy to talk more about in the discussion. Um, the treatment effect is much larger for farmers who have high measured levels of intrinsic reciprocity, um, as well as for farmers who seem to value the relationship with the cooperative more highly. Um, so just to, to wrap up and kind of lead the discussion a little bit, um, you know, it, we implemented a bundled intervention, which addresses multiple constraints. And we find that it's highly effective at increasing investment in quality upgrading, and that we do see quality improvements in the areas where it would otherwise be low. So in future work, we kind of aim to unbundle the intervention somewhat and, and test the importance of each of these components, um, as well as trying to measure some potential GE effects and uh, looking at quality changes in local markets. Um, there are some issues for scaling up results and, and, and a project like this. Um, testing and certification infrastructure is really inaccessible to small producers. And even for cooperatives, uh, they, they would have trouble accessing existing testing infrastructure. Um, there's also credit constraints at higher levels, like if a cooperative wanted to implement a contract like this, they might um, have trouble accessing credit. Um, and potentially uh, the role of complementary inputs like improved seeds for farmers, um, despite being what we might call technology adopters, um, farmers in this context are still, still seeing pretty uh, low yields. So I will stop there um, and look forward, to, uh, look forward to your comments and the discussion. Thank you. And I don't know if I can see the chat. Let me stop sharing my screen. So please feel free to just jump in. Um, so uh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, so, so the papers I know in this literature, they tend to have a very hard time in the first stage to get any adoption. So you might know the like the the rug paper in Egypt and the soccer ball in Pakistan and and Esther De Flo also has a paper with fertilizer adoption. It seems extremely hard. They all want to measure the effect of the new technology, so they randomize exposure, and none of the farmers or, or manufacturers adopt this new technology. But for you, you got like ninety percent of the people take it up. So, so is this something super simple, or do they? really realize that the, that the, the FIDO standards are extremely important for groundnuts. So I, I, I do think that this is a relatively simple thing by comparison of adopting new machinery for, um, for cutting soccer ball um, uh, components. You know, this is, this is a pretty simple thing for farmers to apply and use and the costs are relatively low. It's about 17 US dollars to treat one hectare. Um, so certainly in terms of scale, this is, not, this is maybe not on the same level. Um, but I do think that, you know, one kind of suggestive thing here is that when we first introduced this technology to farmers at baseline, um, we explained, we gave kind of a standardized script about, about aflatoxins, the potential health risks, also the economic impacts of being unable to access markets and introduced this new technology. Um, and we gave farmers the conditions of their at baseline and elicited kind of a non-binding measure of intentions to adopt. And so what we see is that in, there is a treatment effect in this non-binding measure, but it's much smaller. So farmers in the control group really are interested in the technology and would like to adopt it. But when it came time to put up money, they either were unable to do so or chose not to do so. So you know, I think that for me, that, that, on, that does suggest that the credit constraints really play a role here. Um, but, but also suggests that there is a lot of interest in this and, and addressing the constraints, um, not just credit, but the other constraints as well, um, can really kind of unlock that interest and enable them to, to follow through with those intentions. You had sort of a really difficult um, you know, job to try to present the relevant pieces of this thing in your, in your time limit. I'd be, I'd, I'd be really interested in knowing more about the cooperative contract and the side selling you you mentioned sure um so this is this is a this is a market that kind of has a a, a legacy of these state established state controlled cooperatives which has now more recently liberalized and allowed kind of um um other buyers to operate in local markets and and sell kind of in a parallel market to to exporters 
Um, so e existing demand in these markets is really heavily driven by Chinese demand. Um, and the Chinese are, are a, a producer of, of groundnuts, but also a big importer of groundnuts. And their season ends a, a couple of months before the Senegalese season. And so basically there's, there's, there's no ability to predict really what the demand from China is going to be. And so in practice, what this means is that um, market prices from in these spot markets vary by up to 50% from one season to the next. Because in one season, the Chinese buyers will show up and they want to buy everything on the market and they'll pay a huge premium, uh, regardless of quality, regardless of anything. And then the next season, they might not show up at all. So one of the things that I think is, is potentially valuable for farmers here is that um, unlocking additional export markets and unlocking kind of a higher value, higher quality market is, is something that's potentially much, much more stable. Uh, they may not earn a higher price in every season because if the Chinese demand is really high, I'm not sure anyone can compete with that. Um, but uh, you know, it, it's, it would be really tough to plan ahead if, if, if you're always facing these huge swings in potential prices from season to season. And we think that this can, in addition to the health benefits, unlock kind of some stability for farmers to consistently earn a higher price for their output. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's very helpful. I, I have some follow-ups, but I think maybe Andy has a question. Sure. Yeah, I wanted to ask about if you had any estimates of what the, the payback period uh, for these kind of investments were and how they would compare with uh, interest rates that the farmers might face on credit, which would give you a, a sense of whether these are actually credit constraints or whether it might be kind of behavioral factors to do with, I don't know, cause of hyperbolic um, discount rates that you've seen in other fertilizer markets. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, just anecdotally, um, the, the credit constraint is very real in this context. I mean, these are quite small producers. They're basically their sole means of accessing credit is through the cooperatives. Um, so the, 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 the investment in this technology is quite small um, and, and farmers can, can recover that in terms of like the, the, added, the added premium that they can earn. Um, with a relatively reasonable fraction of their output from a hectare. So if they treat one hectare, they might, they might yield about one ton. Um, the, the break even for, for selling at the premium price would be, um, I can't remember offhand, maybe 250 kilos. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit of room for farmers to, to break even and, um, and, and earn a profit based on the, the premiums that are available for high quality. Um, you know, we fixed a premium in our experiment, but there's actually was matched or exceeded by exporters when we actually turned around and, and, and um, offered these high quality groundnuts to exporters. Um, so I don't know if that ex exactly answers your question, but um, essentially the, you know, the, the, the credit constraint is a, is a, is a big factor here. Um, and I think there might be a different, there might be a different story if farmers become more used to using this technology and, and have some more information in advance about saving up. Um, the, this is pretty new in the market as well. Uh, this was the, the first agricultural season that this was available in the market in Senegal. Um, so there wasn't really an alternative for farmers who are really liquidity constrained in terms of planning ahead or finding other sources of credit um, so close to the planting um, season. Looks like we have about 22 seconds left before we're all kicked out. So if anyone has a super quick question. Otherwise, I will just say thank you very much um, and looking forward to uh, continuing to participate in this workshop with everyone.